Welcome to Sustainable Farm Insights, a sustainability programme brought to you by the Irish Farmers Journal and Lambia Ireland. The economic and environmental challenges facing Irish farmers is well known and the aim of this programme is to help tackle these challenges and assist Irish farmers across all enterprises to adopt good management practices and new technologies as they drive to deliver economic and environmental sustainability on their farm. Every week on the pages of the Farmers Journal and online on Lambia Connect and on farmersjournal.ie, we bring the latest in national and international scientific research and knowledge into a practical guide for farmers. And now we are bringing the pages to life. And in this episode, with the help of three farmers from a range of enterprises and chagas, we look at the importance of soil health and how it will deliver on our sustainability goals. My name is Andy Doyle. Uh, I'm Tilly's editor with the Irish Farmers Journal and uh, we're looking today at the whole area of soil health. We're down here at the minute on the farm of Francie Gorman down in Leash and I'm joined uh, for the discussion on the soil and the health of the soil and things that relate to healthy soil by David Wall of Chagask. David's a researcher and a soil expert in Chagas Johnstown Castle and also by David Cooney who is uh, an agronomist with Lambia Ireland. The Sustainable Farm Insights programme is supported by Lambia Ireland uh, in conjunction with the Farmers Journal. Right, Francie, will you tell us what kind of farming that you're doing here? Uh, we're, we're suckler to beef and sheep, uh, finishing, finishing all the lambs and finishing the bulk of the cattle, maybe sell some of them in the stores. Grazing uh, indoors over winter and it's grass silage and meal, nothing oh. fancy. What kind of, of winter housing uh, systems do you have? Uh, mainly slats with straw bedding for the suckler cows and obviously straw bedding for the sheep as well. They go in. Uh, we keep out as long as possible. Obviously, it's December here today, and we have we still have a good supply of grass for them. So we'd be hoping to put them in maybe, you know, five to five to six weeks before lambing. Just to to, to make them snug and comfortable. Yeah, and, yeah, and to get them acclimatised. Well, and then with numbers, you have you look, it's easier to handle them in, um, depending on the weather and all that. So it takes that variable out of it. Okay, so basically, you're you're a livestock farmer where grass is your base. Absolutely. Uh, what are you doing? Gra grass grows in your soil. What are you doing? to try and make sure that you're maximising your grass growth and that your soil is healthy for, for your stock? Well look, the, the, I suppose we soil sample on maybe every four or five years, so it's probably about four years I think since we last soil sample and look, we, we wouldn't have a massive problem with lime deficiency here. We're in a high molybdenum area which means we have to kind of cut back on the, on the amount of lime we use but the pH should be around 6.5 I'd say and uh, you know we're all, all the, all the samples come back in the X3 um, and after that then we, we do try to you know uh, rotate the spreading the farmyard manure and slurry around the farm and especially on silage ground you know uh, we try and get it out in the spring and maybe not if we didn't get it out after cutting silage it would certainly go out just before the before the close period and uh, I think it's important to try and get that back in. Um, now we'd only operate a one cut silage uh, um, system here in that you know we'd rotate maybe the silage ground as well so the, the same fields for the main crop silage but what we call if you want to call a second cut would be taken off different fields and as we're standing here in in this field with a a really good solid traditional sod in it uh is reseeding part of your system um well i suppose ideally it might you'd like to say it is but uh the last time we reseeded here was about four years ago we did a, a 15 acre field and Look, I find the cost of it uh, hugely expensive. Uh, it was five grand nearly to, to do that field. And in our system here, you can't justify that. You couldn't justify it year on year. And what we try to do is like, this field has never been receded. And there's a right, you know, you can see it yourself. There's, it's suppose it's eight weeks ago since there was stock down here. The next field down below is, is the same. And, uh, you know, I find if you try and look after the pastures that you have, Get around it with your, with your slurry and dung in, you know, in, in, a, in a proper rotation. And we wouldn't be over using nitrogen now. Um, you know, we'd use pasture spart and maybe we'd go back out then at you know, certain times of the year we might use straight nitrogen or, or urea. But um, I think it's, you know, I think the fact that we use a, quite a bit of farmyard manure and slurry is a big help here. Okay, so, but from, from what you're saying then, minding the soil is important to you. Well, it is, yeah, absolutely it is. And, but, uh, and I, and I find, whatever it is about, you know, the likes of these old pastures, they actually take a bit of hardship better than the new reseed. That if you're continually reseeding ground, like this hasn't, this, in my in living memory, this has never been reseeded, this field, uh, for me. And uh, 
you know, it's still producing, I, I don't measure grass, but I know uh, from, you know, how it grazes and how stock perform on it, it's still doing the job for us. So David, Francie has described what he's doing on the farm and it, it, we're standing in a very solid old pasture. Uh, in, in terms of soil health, what, what do we mean by soil health? It's more than just fertility, isn't it? It is certainly, Andy. Um, I suppose, in essence, soil health is a soil that's working in harmony with your farming business. So the key ingredients or the key indicators that we would look at is soil physical health. And when I say soil physical health, I mean soil structure, that the soil is draining, it's able to handle the water, there's enough porosity for the roots to go through, and that physically it's able to take the weight and the pressures that everyday farming puts on it. Secondly, that you have the chemical health. So when I say chemical health, that's soil fertility to many people, but also then that it has a healthy mix of micronutrients to fortify the animals in terms of their vitamins and, and minerals in, in this case, or the crops that might be, but also then that you have carbon in there and carbon being the food for the last leg, which is the biological health. And if we think about the biological health, earthworms are the key indicator because we can see them. So they're nature's plough, as they say, they, they create structure, they create nutrients by, by breaking down that organic matter, but also they are all those biology that we can't see. And they are working in harmony with the business breaking down your organic manure, for instance, as, as Francie has quite rightly said, um, he's spreading his organic manure at a time when the biology is still active, the ground is still warm, and that's working in harmony with the grass and then with the, the livestock on this farm. So can, can a lot of that stuff be physically seen? How much of that can a farmer see? Can we, can we feel soil health to some degree? Certainly, this is probably the, the, the best tool. We think about the soil sampler, and um, let's just take a look now. Please. So what we're doing here is we're taking out a small little square and that's, that's plenty just to, so that we can have a, a look down and see what's going on down deep. So we're getting a right hardy bit of a sod there I'd say yeah, that, yeah. that last minute. Now so okay. if we take a look at this. The first thing I see is at the very end of that sod of the, what was the bottom of it I can see roots down that far. So look at it's, it's, uh, things are looking really good here. We can see all these roots. I'll just put the knife in under them there. Uh, that's the first thing. So we have plenty of roots. So this grass sward is not relying on a minimal amount of roots exploring this soil. As I said, the physical health is really good. If we look at the structure here, it's really good, really friable or really crumbly. And that means then that the roots are not impeded. They can move through a larger volume of soil here and pick up the essential nutrients that they need. That might be your nitrogen, your phosphorus, your potassium, but also the micronutrients. So it's not impeded. And the other big thing here is there's plenty of storage for water because in between all these cracks, if I open, open this up, there's loads of air space and space to store water, but also to let water through at times like going into the winter now when uh, the, the, the rainfall is heavier. So we're talking about the percolation of rain. Yes. That it goes into the ground. And then of course, one of the, one of the things that soil, a healthy soil will do for us, it strips out nutrients and things that are in rainwater or in water on the move to prevent them from getting to the rivers and streams, etc. So essentially, uh, it's nature's filter. Yeah. So the, the water that we'll say the farming community and the rural community are drinking in their wells and everything, this soil here will strip out, it's like that sponge taking out those nutrients, storing them in the surface where the plant roots can recycle them over and over again. But from the way the sod stayed together when you lifted it, my guess is that there is a mass of roots in that whole area holding all of that together. Yeah, and look, at, let's just dig into it now and we'll, we'll take a little look into what you're, what you're talking about there. And you can see here, again, loads of, of, of roots. So really good in terms of holding up the stock, especially in the shoulders of the year, when I suppose the grass mightn't be grown as, as, as vigorously as it would in the summer. So this is almost the foundation there. And that root system is very dense, very uh, 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 good network of roots. And there's also good evidence here of as I said, the indicators 
the earthworms will 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 mine this guy now we won't we won't damage him too mm, much so slice him up. Uh, perfect there in terms of earthworms in there another key indicator of soil bi biological health or healthy soils in in general what i would say overall is i suppose the signs are really good here it's kind of more of the same mind what you have uh, i suppose the old adage that prevention is better than cure really applies in terms of soil health here so mind minding this soil i suppose taking the soil samples and and francie has said he's he's lyman and he's also uh, um, taking the soil samples to keep an eye on the nutrients in, in terms of that and then i suppose things like um using the slurries and the manures in the right way to put back in what you're taking out and, and keep that, them balanced and keep them balanced that's yeah, the key yeah. it's, it's it's the key is i suppose spread the love a little bit yeah. in terms of don't put it all out in the one field all the time spread it around judge by your soil samples in terms of nutrients but also then where there's maybe a silage taken out or a crop taken off where it's a total offtake there's no recycling like when the animals are here that you put the nutrients back on those fields like the slurries okay david uh, thanks for that and, and i'm going to switch over just to ask david cooney david can i ask just your general opinion of farmer attitude to soil health well to soil maintenance soil health and soil fertility my guess is that there's a lot more reference being put on fertility than on general health. Would I be right? I, I think so, Andy. I think that's a, that's a fair comment to say. The focus probably has been completely on fertility and possibly not always on balanced fertility. You know, as David just alluded to there, the, the important components of not just having pH, but having the micronutrients and everything else in balance. And, and even the P and K. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and probably more so to focus on NPK and you know, P and K and not even on pH, which, which as we all know is, is as important as, as the other three. Because if we, if we stand back nowadays in, in modern farming systems, it doesn't matter what farming system we're in, whether it's grass or tillage or dairy or beef or sheep, it doesn't really matter. But when, we're, when we bring in equipment to do work, it's just monstrous stuff that's coming in a lot of the time. It's heavy on the ground. And if the land is not resilient, we're, we're, we're pushing the soil tighter and tighter and tighter together. And of course, that's giving rise to the difficulties and the challenges that we have, because the tighter the soil gets, the more difficult it is for the water to get down. And water that doesn't get down runs across the surface. And if it runs across the surface, it's gone out in the gate brown. It's taken possibly nitrate and definitely phosphorus with it in that brown. And that's a whole set of other uh, problems that, that we as farmers are being blamed for and that we have some capacity to fix with just good management. Thank you very much, Francie. And David, again, thank you, thank you all very much for, for your time on this one. Thanks, thank Andy. you. We're here looking at soil health on the farm of Shane O'Loughlin. This is part of the Sustainable Farm Insights programme operated by the Farmers' Journal and Lambia Ireland. And I'm joined in that conversation by David Wall of Chogosk, Johnstown Castle, and David Coney of Glambia. Shane, what type of farming do you carry out here in South Kildare? So we're, we're growing on the farm, we're growing um, 14 and a half tonnes of grass, that's what we would grow this year. We had a, a drought last May, which sort of hindered things a bit. Um, the, the cows would be a sort of British Friesian Holstein cow. Um, the fertility would have been, would have been I think we had 9% or so empty last year, um, this year gone by. And um, I suppose where we are, we've, we owned um, 140 acres and then we're renting another around 350 acres. And it'd be also where we are in, in Kildare, it mainly, it'd be in the middle of horse country and there'd be a lot of stud farms around us. And we, we're, um, I suppose we're renting about five different farms around us. And uh, we, um, we've used that, some of it we use for silage, some of it for grazing cows and some of it for grazing replacements. Are you stocked heavy then overall across that? I mean, 340 acres, 200 cows. Yeah, yeah. I suppose on, on the grazing, on the grazing, um, the, like the grazing platform, we'd be stocked at around uh, three cows to the hectare, and then over the whole farm, we'd be down to around 2.2, 2.2, you know. So that, that's helping you to be able to kind of mine the soil beneath your feet, beneath their feet, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And and um, I suppose like we we'd, we'd be conscious of environment the way things are going and we're trying to sort of any new practice coming out we're trying to adopt as in like with trail and chew for spreading slurry or dribble bar using protected urea or you know whatever 
whatever's coming on stream and can help. So you we're, are using those, Shane? We're using those and we're oh. open to try to use whatever will help and, and you know, just to, we, we use protected urea this year and we, we, we use it in spring and in the back end and we've got a great response of it in, in the back end of the year. You know. So you're predominantly slurry, I'm, I'm guessing then, based on the number of cows, etc. We would, I'd like it to be, to be we, we'd be spreading slurry, I suppose, it'd be all contractor, but it'd be, it'd be spread with the trail and chew or dribble bar. And, and are you moving that around the farm or kind we, of loading we, it close to the farm? We would, well, in, in, the, in the springtime, um, you'd have 60 days in the first rotation. So every paddock grazed, you'd be doing your best to get slurry out on ground conditions allowing. And then in, in the back end of the year as well, like in the middle of the season when you're grazing every 18 to 21 days, you can't really spread there. We tried it even with the trail and chew, but it, it's, it's just, it, it's not ideal. But at the start of the year and, and uh, the back end of the year, it, it's, it's great to get it out and you, you have plenty of time for to get into the side, you know. Okay, and do you have any dung in, this, in the system? We do, well, the, what we do with the dung is we've, uh, we've, I suppose we would have had issues with compaction and different things. And I suppose from, we tried like using aerators, you know, to, to the spikes to tear up, to, to, to sort of to loosen up the soil. But um, I was on a, a call there last year with the, with the Monte Farm programme and, uh, well, two years ago. And uh, the fellow was saying, if the more dung you use, the better it is for the worms in the soil. And the worms are a lot better for loosening up the soil than any aeration that you'll do with, with mechanical, uh, you know, intervention. So that's what we've done, and we we found it. It seems to be working well. And the 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 fella that spreads the, the dung, it um it chops it real fine. We wouldn't go out too heavy on the, on the ground. Like we'd we'd try to spread it um, you know um after the last round, sort of from the first of October until the deadline. You spread as much as we can on paddocks, and it, see, it seems to work. And then a lot on silage ground or seeded ground, you know. But it, it seemed to be great for the to get the to say that if you spread a, a field worms will come in from the next field. It's like a gold to them, you know, so it's, it's a... And you feel you're seeing a benefit across your well, land it seems, well, where you, know, you can put the dung land specifically? that can sort of aerate the soil and sort up, it can only benefit, you know, that's what we'd be thinking anyway, you know. Okay, you know? okay, well I'm going to take that question then and move it over to David Wall. David, we're talking there about putting on organic matter in quantities, well, big or small, depending on what you have to try and aerate the soil. Is that actually what's happening? So Andy, you're, you're, to answer your question, um, in terms of having that dung and that manure out there, that's going to help us to build resilience into the soil in terms of with the cows uh, grazing the paddock and uh, we'll say at a higher stocking rate on the grazing platform, there needs to be resilience because under that compression, when the cows hooves go into that paddock, that dung or that manure acts as a kind of a shock absorber between the mineral matter, so the sand, silt and clay in that, in that soil. It also then creates uh, um, an environment for the soil biology, so those earthworms to come up to get that food, that, that manure, that carbon, and they leave behind them then more pore space for the water to get through and for the plants. Like Shane has grown a big amount of grass here, so uh, it takes uh, a big volume of soil to feed that type of uh, a yield and that's where the dung can help in terms of nutrients but also in terms of resilience and, and standing up to that system. And that physical structure is also helping to provide pore space for the roots to grow which is part of the reason why you can get the big yields because if this soil tightens up on us which can happen for all kinds of reasons not least just the density of grazing animals if it tightens up it's slowing down water percolation and it's more importantly slowing down root growth. No, exactly. And, and I, I suppose the bigger volume that you can explore, so once we close up that soil and it's really tight, now we have less of the soil that we can explore with the roots, but also, as you say, in terms of air passing in, we have to remember that uh, on a dairy farm, uh, you're trying to get out early, cows are calving. So for that soil to warm up and to begin to produce grass, we need it that it's open enough for the warmer air that begins to come on those good days in spring to get in there. If that's closed up or if it's full of water, air can't get in, so it's slower to warm up and slower then to produce grass to feed that grazing herd as it calves down. So what exactly then is the dung that's, that Shane spoke about doing in terms of opening up the soil? It's, it's obviously triggering nature. Yes, yes, and, and, and I suppose that's it in a nutshell. Uh, it's doing multiple things uh, in terms of the three aspects of soil health that we're, we're interested in. 
So that physical, it's creating that resilience between the soil particles that, yes, when the bit of weight or bit of pressure goes over it, that it, it can compress under it, but then spring back out. That's the sponge, the sponge like analogy. The sponge, like yeah. the sponge. Yeah. In terms of the chemical health, what it's doing is it's a store of nutrients in itself, number one, but also then it helps to condition those other nutrients through the final leg, through biology, chewing up on that organic matter and manure and recycling those nutrients back in and then also re-releasing other nutrients that are stored in soil organic matter. So it's, it's probably a, a key component in terms of the business, in terms of the soil, getting that organic matter in there is fundamental. And also then you also have the added benefits in terms of the environment, climate change. So let's take a look at what's, what's happening under yep. your feet or under the cow's feet more specifically. So I'm going to dig this first one here. I see there's, there's a little bit of a divot there from, 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 from the cows going through and you know, which is, is normal in any, any uh, livestock system livestock farm and we're just going to take out a, um, a small amount here and just see what's see what's in here okay so in terms of 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 the the soil overall it's looking pretty good and um, there is some evidence up here if 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 you can see uh, this bit up here in the surface, it's only probably three, four inches deep, seems to be a lot more solid. And if I peel that away, it's, it's coming away, away as one block. Yeah. So it's a little bit of akin to, we'll say in, in, in other soils, people might call it a pan or a, a, a block, but you can see that top block is largely a, an entity of its own. And it's not fully linked in terms of the root system with the soil underneath it. So the roots are actually been impeded a little bit on underneath there. We don't have as many roots down here in this, although really good structure. And that um, this this soil up here, and, and if I if I just drop down that bit for a minute and we we try to break this open. Now, so again, there is some good roots. They're not going maybe as deep as we would like especially in terms of if, if I've picked a, a, an area here where there was a divot or where there was a, 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 a cow hoof mark, it's probably not the same, Shane, you're, you're saying that you're, you're growing 15 tonnes of, of, of grass. So it can't be the same everywhere, but this is, a, I suppose, a little bit of a, an early warning sign. Um, the other thing here is we can put that, like a jigsaw, back together in the soil that's probably has a, a, a good soil structure, that shouldn't be the case. So again, just an early warning in terms of the, the system that there is a little bit of, of I suppose, a compacted layer, it's not that deep. So again, it's easily to remedy. And I think Andy, uh, going back to your last question, where you talk about the organic manure, organic manure can help us to remedy this problem. One of the things that I recall we, we saw on a different farm when we were in a permanent pasture is that you physically could not tear that sod apart with your hands. You had to cut it yeah. because of the density of roots. Yeah. And that same density of roots is the links in the spot. It's the reinforcing in the soil against the cows walking or the machines coming in or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think uh, that's, that's it in a nutshell. There's less of this, this soil, although not too bad, there's less of this soil is explored with roots. Yeah. So therefore, the, the, the amount of soil that's there to feed the crop is less, just because there's a little bit of compaction in the top. However, I do see here beside me, there, there's actually an old um, dung pat, and we might just have a look to see if there's a difference in there, just for a Because the dung pat, as you're digging it, is the equivalent of Shane spreading dung. It's a lump of stuff rather than a light film of stuff, which we're getting with slurry. Yeah, and, and it's, it's exactly that. Obviously, it's, it's, it's more fibrous than a, a, a small filament of slurry that would go over the ground. Uh, this is a concentrated carbon source. It's like free lunch here together. And uh, what usually happens there is the earthworms will move to that, akin to the dung, 
and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll see what the soil structure is like. And of course, as I would always say, if they find a feast, because, they're, because they contain both the male and the female parts, their instant reaction is to multiply. So you might have had one arrive, but you could have 10 in, in, in a short space of time. And you can see here straight away, we don't have that same uh, issue in the surface. The soil so is breaking up in your hands, obviously. The soil is breaking up. It's extremely friable here. This is the bottom bit, this is the top bit. And again, if we look in here, it's coming, coming apart much different. So much more crumbly, um, uh, great structure. And also uh, there is evidence there in terms of earthworms in here, uh, etc. So they're doing exactly what, we, what, what, what it says on the tin. They're moving to the food. Um, and with that, they're improving the structure. And you can see here, they're curled up, I suppose it's a, it's a cold day today, but there's plenty of actually earthworm eggs in here as well. That's where that little bit of farmyard manure or dung that's on a, on a, a farm can be really precious to put where there's a, a, a risk, we'll say, in a headland area, especially in, in maybe around a gateway or, or, or wherever else, or an area that's trafficked more frequently and really get that working for you rather than just putting it out in the middle of the field. Okay, I'm going to move over to David Cooney and I'm going to ask David, we saw over the last, oh, well, I suppose a lot of this decade, we've seen about 60,000 hectares migrate from a, a, a continuous tillage scenario into grass and generally into dairying. And some of that land has been very difficult to get into a kind of a state that looks like what's beneath our feet here. Could you explain to us what has, what's been going on and why people are having this difficulty getting t worn tillage ground into good grassland? Andy, to answer your question there, that comes back to what we've just spoke about here and it's back to the, the physical structure of the soil and the organic matter of the soil. As we both know in a lot of continuous tillage soils, they have seen little or none organic matter and this has had an impact on the, on the physical structure of the soil. So when that sod or that field is laid down into grass, them same problems still persist and we don't have that structure that David was talking about there to, to produce the kind of yields that Shane wants or, or that, that a dairy farmer expects out of these soils. I think David one of the things that kind of I, I would always say to people and we, we forget very often is that the fertility supply to a, a grass soil is generally from three sources. The fertilizer bag that we're all familiar with, the slurry that is an inevitable part of those systems but the soil itself is the third phase. And in a situation where we have so little organic matter in the soil because it's been broken down with continuous tillage over the years, the soil is not given that little bit extra, which is critical in the spring, critical in the autumn. And I think that's why it's so slow. And it's, it's just, it's almost as if we have to rebuild the system to prime it again from scratch. Is that broadly, you think, what's happening? Absolutely, and it's, it's back to that soil organic matter that's feeding that soil biology that, that, that in itself is returning to the soils. And as that soil organic matter and the structure was depleted, the soil biology was also depleted. And unfortunately, there is no quick turnaround to that. It is, it is a, a probably a long-term thing that you need to start improving all aspects of the soil. So that's the fertility, the structure, the biology to get it to produce the, the yields that we, that we need from it. So that's all three legs of the stool. Absolutely. That, that soil science stool yeah. that we talked about. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, probably some of that needs to happen before that field even goes into grass, you know, and ideally that's the way it should happen, that you start feeding that organic matter in, you know, into the structure of the soil so that when you do put it, when you do lay it down there, you're, that process has started. Gentlemen, Shane, David, David, thank you very much. I'm on the farm of James Ashmore uh, to talk about soil health. Uh, we're talking soil health because it's an important part of all farming enterprises and also we're doing this uh, as part of the programme called Sustainable Farm Insights, which the Farmers Journal is doing in conjunction with Lambia Ireland. And for the discussion here, I'm joined by David Wall, who is a soil scientist and a soils expert from Chagas and Johnstown Castle, and also by David Cooney, who is an agronomist with Glambia. James, we're now going to talk about tillage because you're a tillage farmer. Can you just explain to us the type of 
farming that you're doing, what you're growing, and how you're managing the whole land base that you have access to. All right, Andy. Uh, we're well. We're a mixed farm with beef and tillage, but uh, we run um, sort of a nine-year, six-crop rotation. We have uh, three years of grass, followed by maize, then going into winter wheat, winter barley, and cover crop, which we're standing in now, of uh, fodder, rape, leafy turnip, phacelia vetch. Then we're going into uh, peas, followed by gluten-free oats, and then back to winter barley again before we go into grass. So you have a very diverse rotation. The one thing that's unfamiliar in that, I'm guessing, to most tillage farmers, maybe two things. One is the catch crop that we're standing in because lots of people still don't do it or don't do anything even to replace it. And the other one is the really interesting one, the three years of grass. You have cattle, so I suppose that makes it easier because you have a market. Yeah, well, I, I don't have to worry about my, where it's going or trying to source uh, my, uh, the market, but yeah, we primarily use it for, with our cattle. I make hay as well, it goes towards the uh, equine market, but I find it's good for kind of breaking the, uh, we're in a plough based system, so it's kind of breaking that constant tilling over and over again, kind of uh, give the chance the soil to recover, build up your uh, beneficial bacteria and, or, and fungi as well. So. Uh, it's advantageous in that and also we uh, fatten store lambs over the winter so it gives us another market, another way to earn a few extra quid. And it's three years of no shaking about and that's a, yep. a plus for the soil to improve itself. Yeah, it's also a way we uh, primarily apply our slurry out on grassland so it's another way to get uh, other nutrients back out as well and the farmyard manure that we produce all goes back out in the tillage ground as well. Uh, farmyard manure as a thing from slurry or, or both? Uh, we've both, yeah, okay. we've uh, straw bedding and then we've got slat slatted shed as so well. So you're, you're running a, a circular system, you're taking nutrients from here, putting them over there, taking them from there, putting them back here. Yeah, we, we try to keep a closed system as much as possible so we're not in, uh, bringing in any uh, outside unwarranted uh, things like black grass or that. And can I ask just as a direct follow-up from that, James, I've always advocated that having land uncultivated in any way for a couple of years is a great help to decrease the pressures, general weed pressures. Are you finding that? Perhaps you're not, whether it be grass weeds or any weeds. Well, I suppose with the rotation we have as well, you're, because you have the different crops, you're uh, dealing with different types of weeds and it kind of alleviates pressures, especially when you have a, a change between spring and winter. Uh, certain weeds are getting suppressed by having it in grass because uh, any uh, weed bank that would be in it gets will die out after a few years. Well, one of the things that strikes me is that you, you have a big concentration in what you've said on getting soil into good working order. You have your three years break, you have your, your dung and your uh, slurries coming out and you have your catch crops going in. They don't happen automatically. You're doing it to try and improve the general quality of your soil. Yeah. And the question then is, are, are you improving the quality of your soil? Do you think you are? Uh, how, and how can you see it if you are seeing something? Well, I've seen a bit of resilience starting to build up in the system. Like in 2018, we were, well, we were slightly affected, but compared to other people in the area, we didn't suffer as much with the drought. Even in 2020 now as well, we didn't have too much, uh, nothing major anyway, but even workability of the soil as well, it, it, it's getting better. Plus, uh, keeping, uh, preventing winter erosion by having something growing there as much as possible, preventing uh, wind and water erosion, so it helps uh, keep it all together. I don't want all my uh, nutrients running off into the neighbouring farm. So in general you would, you would believe that by minding the soil you are making life easier for yourself because if you're, if you're increasing the workability of the soil you're making it easier to get your planting done, yeah. physically, diesel wise yeah. and speed wise. Yeah and you're also helping many other things in the process. Yeah, well, it just makes life easier, and again, the resilience is important. It might be hard to put a, a monetary figure on it, but if you can kind of prevent yourself from the extreme, or help protect yourself from the extremes, it's a lot easier. And would you say, on balance, year on year, that you're doing a little bit better than the fellow over the fence, and I don't mean that to insult any <laughs> neighbour, but it's just, you've done every, you're doing everything right in the soil, the theory is it gives higher yields. Yeah, well, again, I suppose the keeping a living root in the soil as much as possible, you're getting as much carbon down into your soil and it's feeding your microorganisms and building up your bacteria and fungi, your beneficials, and that can only be positive. And compared to some of the neighbours, I, I would be seeing some improvements, all right. Okay, well, you've mentioned biology in the soil, feeding the roots, getting the carbon down. I'm going to switch now over to David Wall and ask David about how other farmers uh, can can begin to 
bring that biological life back into the soil? Well, actually, in terms of feeding the biology here, James is actually doing it. He's doing it here, in, especially in this field, um, where the uh, cover crop or catch crop is serving in multiple functions. So we're on a slopey field, as, 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 as James talked about. There is the potential on a slopey field that the soil starts to wash off. So having this living crop here, the roots holding that soil together, especially a tilled soil that's already after being broken down. But maybe we'll have a, a look in and, and see what we're, we're, uh, what's happening here underneath the, the soil. Because James has been working this soil for so long, trying to keep it in good work and order, will you expect that we'll have a soil here that's much more friable than an awful lot of other tilly soils? Uh, that's what I'm expecting. Yeah, well, and, look. And I'll be very surprised <laughs> if it's not what we find as well. No, I'll take this one up from the side now and we'll see what we, we have. Oh, crikey, there's a lovely soil profile that literally was locked together by active plant roots. It's, yep. it's terrific and to see that. You can look see at how deep there are big roots going down there. Yeah, like if we look at these in terms of the, 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 the fodder rape or, or, or that, they're really getting down there. That tap root is opening up the soil there um, over, the, over the winter. We can see here some of the evidence of the biology colonizing around those roots. So we see that there in terms of, of, of larvae and, and, and eggs. So they are some of the, the, the bigger biology. There's earthworms in there. But essentially what we have here is something that's feeding that biology, uh, especially at this time of the year. We're in the, the winter period. Usually you wouldn't have a source of food in there, especially on worn tillage ground. But what, what James, what you're, what you're doing here is you're putting, putting in the, back in that food over the winter period by having a growing crop. That's pumping carbon. It's also pulling up nutrients from the depths that will be there for that seed when you're planting your cereal or whatever is next in the rotation here. Um, that's going to be closer to the surface when that seedling with the small root is there. David, the one thing that strikes me looking at the, the sod you have in your hand is the length of the root for what looks like a very mediocre plant on top. It's a small plant, but yet it's doing so much work under the ground. Yeah, look, at that's, that's, that's key, I suppose. It's testament to the work that has been put in on this ground that that root is able to get down that deep in such a, a, a short period. Obviously, out of season of, of the main growth, it's still getting down there. And as you say, it's doing a lot of work in its own right in terms of pumping down carbon, um, creating uh, food there for the biology, and then also pulling up uh, uh, the nutrients that may be lost below the root zone um, that typically happens in a field, we'll say, with no green cover over the winter. So if, if what James said earlier and what you're saying now would be true, that all of that soil that's there, which in your hand has been held together largely by plant roots. Yes. If you let that fall now from where you're holding it onto the ground, that probably will all just fracture and go all well, over the place. Well, it's the ultimate test for, for structure and let's Let's have a look. So typically, this is what you would do in terms of, of, of going out and testing soils, uh, looking at their structure and everything. You dig out a, a block like this and let it fall and see what happens because uh, it, it, it's natural. So, and if we look in here, this is a really positive wow. sign. So we have no regular shapes here. They're all irregular. You can see the way that's after breaking down there um, into the different aggregates. They're very friable. I think that's going back to what you talked about, James, in terms of, of the workability of the soil. So it's a lot more workable. And you can see there it's fracturing, breaking down. And we bring this back up into shot. You can see there, if I pull that gently, see all the, all the nu nutrients all the, the soil that's adhering to those uh, roots over the, over the winter, they're all feeding biology. The nutrients is coming back up and being stored in those, and that sets you up for the following crop. And David, when we talk about biology, we're talking about 
big things like earthworms we can see and small things like bacteria uh, and fungi that we can't see with our eyes. What kind of numbers would be there in, in, in if you just took that spade we dug up, that sod yeah. we dug up, what kind of numbers of organisms would be in there? Yeah, look, at it's, it's, it's a great question and it, it's, it's a bit mind-boggling. So in that simple square of soil, if we think about that in terms of, of, of uh, a simple teaspoon, if I was to, to, to make you a, an answer, has about a billion bacteria. It has meters, lengths of football fields, in terms of uh, mycelia or fungi. And then yeah, in terms of strings of fungi, the string as of, grows, of yeah. fungi if, if you were to measure them that way. So that simple square, we'll say 20 centimetres by 20 centimetre, has trillions, trillions of bacteria that are working away there. Uh, countless earthworms, because of what I'm talking about here, this all is nutrient rich. Um, and then uh, bacteria uh, and other uh, fauna uh, that that's, uh, are, are working there in the soil. So it, it is truly mild boggling, but uh, this type of system helps us to feed that system. And if that system is working for you, um, it'll make the soil a lot more resilient in the, in the future. Uh, your crop um, uh, growth is going to be better and your recycling of nutrients is going to be better. So it all works in harmony. Okay, we're going to just move on then and I'm going to just go slip over to, to David. If you take what we're seeing here, how typical is that of what we're seeing generally on Tilly's farms, in Tilly's fields, and what can people simply begin to think of doing to get their land into a, a structure like this where we're widening the window when we can go in and cultivate it and manage it, and where we also decrease the energy requirement. So to answer your question, Andy, unfortunately this is not a typical tillage field and probably what's really unique about this farm is the rotation that he has. It's probably one that many guys would love to have, but it wouldn't be typical, as you're well aware, of most tillage farms in, in Ireland. Okay, so we, we, have, we have the rotation. What part of what James is doing would you love to be able to bring into a tillage scenario as distinct from like to bring in to a tillage scenario? Well look at the, the, the three year grass lay is definitely something that would, would massively benefit and, and we spoke earlier about you know the traffic trafficability of soil and that and, and the fact that you can rest that soil for three years and put it in there is, is of massive benefit to any soil rotation. The cover crop is probably the easiest one that you know most farmers can do and as James said he has the ready made market for the grass many many tillage farmers wouldn't have that and land mightn't be suitable for grazing in terms of fencing or access or, or for other reasons so the, the the cover cropping is probably the easiest one but what the one you would most like would probably be that rotational lay that 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 break yes for for structural reasons for weed suppression reasons and Lots of other ones as well. And, and again, and, and it's, it's the variance within the rotation too that he has. So he mentioned he was, you know, going from this cover crop into peas, into oats, into cereals and back to grass and, you know, jumping through different plant species there. That has to have massive benefit to the soil biology as well. He's jumping through species and some of them are taken out his need for nitrogen. Some of them are giving him a different family of, of pesticides to use to control a problem. And hopefully he doesn't have very many because this type of farming is, is significant in terms of reducing overall pressure. How important is that good, physical, healthy soil to withstanding the weight of the machines that ma most modern farmers have or most farmers have nowadays. So I suppose the challenge is to get to that state and, and you really do need to have your to have your soils. The, the other the other point James made about the, the resilience in the soils in terms of drought, we all saw the impact of, of, a, of a relatively short drought this year in, in the month of May and into June and what that did and it definitely showed up on more than on the long term tillage soils that wouldn't have the organic matter or wouldn't have the rotation. You know the effects of that was quite worse was worse. And we'd always have thought or said that heavy soils naturally hold more water. And yet it was some of those heavier soils this year that took the biggest beating. Yeah, and, and again, them heavier soils, it's the trafficking they've taken, it's the loss of soil structure, you know, which in turn is the loss of soil, soil organic matter, soil biology. So it's, it's the, the whole, all the factors are contributing to give you that, you know, that ultimate, that healthy soil that allows you in and will produce the crop for you. And for me, the biggest thing about getting all of this right is that as James said at the onset, having that soil healthy is a prerequisite to getting big yields. Yes. 
having your soil healthy is also one of the greater ways of taking some cost out of the equation. It could be one herbicide saved. It could be 15 to 30 kilos of nitrogen, depending on where you are in the rotation. All of that lower cost is ultimately contributing to more profit at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, for me, sustainability and healthy soil must be about generating profit for farmers, because that's what we need most of all. James, David, David, thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Over the course of the, of the three farms that we visited uh, as part of this series, uh, there were a couple of particular points that come out. I'm starting by saying that the, the summary of a healthy soil is that we have the physical, which is the structure, the chemical, which is the fertility, and the biological, which we measure by earthworm of activity. When all of those are working well, then the seat on that stool is providing the ecosystem services which do so much for us. I think it is very important for all farmers to remember that when that soil is healthy, when it's humming, when we're getting those roots growing down through the profile deep into the ground, we're depositing carbon down there. We have roots that can grow more easily. When they grow more easily, the crops above produce more yield. And at the end of the day, the major beneficiary, uh, well, there are two beneficiaries. One is the farmer, because more yield generally is more profit. And the second one is the, is the environment, because we're protecting so many of the ills that we've been talking about for the past number of years now. And, and I just want to thank uh, the three farmers that we visited, uh, Shane O'Loughlin, Francie Gorman, and James Ashmore, uh, for allowing us in and to see the things that the, the good things that they're doing on their farms and also in particular to say thanks to David Wall of Chagas for joining me and uh, David Cooney of Glambia as well and thank you for taking the time to watch. <laughs>